Of course, now we, we realize that you're going to deplete your supply sooner or later. They're not making a lot of dinosaurs anymore. a magnet for war. Oil starts wars. The Sudan, for example, Darfur, what everybody is treating as an ethnic and a religious struggle is in fact in part a struggle about major oil finds located in the south which means that the government in the north, a different ethnic and religious makeup, is displacing those people and moving them out of the area so that those oil revenues belong to them. has always been associated with war. Our very first wars, World War I, World War II, have very important elements of oil in them as a reason for the war, as allowing the war to go on, as a way of securing supply. During the 70s, there were the political problems, the war between uh, the Egyptian and the Israelis, in which the, uh, the oil boycott took place. Khomeini's revolution, we have the Palestinian problems. Wars between Iraq and Iran. The first war that was absolutely about oil was Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, which was really about seizing an oil field.
Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Iraq oil is a giant uh, that has been kept dormant for so many, many years. This oil has been the least explored, the least developed, and the least produced. There are lots of people who will tell you that oil had nothing to do with the war if you go to Washington. Um, and we used to call it the O word that nobody would say. But in fact, all evidence points to the fact that the United States, which did not secure areas of weapons of mass destruction, but did in fact secure the oil fields, the United States had plans to bring in U.S. companies in Iraq where they had previously not been allowed to operate. Um, that there were maps of the oil fields involved in the planning of the war, that in 1998, long before the war, people were arguing for this as a way of securing energy supplies in the United States. I can't get inside their heads to know all of the rationale for going to war with Iraq, but there are many people who believe at least a part of the reasons for being there is the geopolitical position of Iraq and the fact that it sits right in the middle of the world's oil patch. The Iraqis wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And they were happy that the Americans helped. But look at what happened. After Saddam Hussein, there is no institutions, there is no state, there is no army, there is no real police force. People are kidnapped, uh, killed, decapitated, everything. There is no law. They made the country stateless without a state. Instead of creating conditions for peace, they are, con they are making conditions for conflict. More and more oil is going to come from less and less stable places, less and less secure places, places that actually challenge the taking of oil in the first place. Oil fuels war, it's a catalyst for war, it's something that prolongs war, it intensifies war. This is not a pretty picture. I suppose that the classification of reserves depends on the motivations of the person that's classifying them. Sort of keep people guessing in a way, keep them off balance. Most numbers that you will see around the world that lead to these numbers that we were talking about include proven plus probable, and sometimes even possible. In fact, the public data is extremely misleading and misunderstood. OPEC exaggerated how much oil it's, it's got left for all sorts of political reasons. You know, this is an old story. Casting doubt on the numbers of reserves in the Middle East as published. In 1985, Kuwait overnight added 50% to its reserves. At that time, the OPEC quota, that is the percent, the amount of oil that each of the OPEC countries could produce, was based on the reported reserves. So the more you reported, the more you could produce. Two years later, Venezuela doubled its reserves overnight, and that caused the other countries, finally Saudi Arabia, to announce enormous increases overnight, simply to protect their production quota. And these numbers have not changed since. And it's absolutely implausible to imagine that the numbers should say the same when they're all the time producing. I've asked them that, that same question. You know, you, you produce eight or nine million barrels of oil a day, 
and at the end of the year, the reserves are the same as they were, you know, at the beginning, as the same as they were 10 years ago. He said, well, that's our plan. That's our plan. You know, we, we produce this oil, and then we, we prove up reserves to offset uh, the oil that we've produced during the year. So at the beginning of the next year, our reserves are exactly what they were, you know, the year before. Well, whether you believe that or not, I don't know, but that's, that's what they say. That's what they say. Their plan. That's the way it works. <laughs> uh, OPEC countries do not care about what might happen about, uh, from now, 20 years from now, or 30 years, or 40 years from now. They care about what they get now, today. Because uh, these are politicians, they want more money, more money to spend, rationally or irrationally, whatever it is, but they, they have budgets, and they became prisoners of their budget. What may happen 20 years from now, by that time they are dead. They don't care. I'm afraid that we're going to run out of oil and gas a lot sooner than, uh, than lots of people, some people think. Well, it appears to me that when it peaks, they've, they've taken more than half of it out of the ground. Of course, as time goes on, they might find a way to extract more of that oil than they do now. They can extract it over a period of time, but it's not necessarily economically f feasible. Well, it might be at $50 a barrel or, barrel or more, but we're going to come come to a time when we don't have oil. Well, this is one of the, you know, the, the obsession of, the, of, of many oil people. And they say, well, we will reach a point in which oil production will not increase anymore. And we'll be, they call it peaking out. And then it will decrease slowly. We are here, we are near, we are not, nobody knows. They try to take the example of the oil production in the United States. The real saga of petroleum continues at a greater pace than ever. Down in Peru, in California, Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, millions of workers, engineers, geologists find new reserves, build new rigs, sink new shafts. The United States had been the largest oil producer on Earth for almost 100 years, and nobody thought we'd ever peak. The pump does not know when midnight comes. Days are the same to it. Each day, every day, it brings us another 24 hours of progress, building our nation, guarding its security, assuring the future of America. And many, if not all, oil geologists thought that that would go on forever. Throughout this half century, Dr. Hubbard has been a continuous student of energy resources and their implications in human affairs. As long as 20 years ago, Dr. Hubbard was pointing out to his colleagues in the petroleum industry that the United States would probably reach its peak of petroleum production within 10 to 15 years. He was virtually laughed out of his profession for making such a ridiculous prediction. The optimists back then were saying, this is crazy. We're finding six barrels of oil for every barrel that we consume. We're never going to run out or peak or anything like that. He realized that oil discovery had peaked in the 1930s and was declining. Uh, and he could extrapolate that to figure out how much oil there would be altogether. 